So, hello, gentlemen. How are you? How are you doing this morning? Hi, Jeremy. Good. Hi. All good. All good. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, we are here. We are having a conversation on esports with a very uh, exciting panel. Uh, so, we have uh, Max, and then we also have Joe, and we have Ronnie. These are esports enthusiasts, and they are going to be having a session with us on the uh, esports potential in Africa. And I'll be happy if they can introduce themselves. So we will start with uh, Joe, just a, a brief introduction about yourself and what you do. And then we will move to Max, and Ronnie will also introduce himself. And then we'll move forward from there. So, Joe, take it up. Thanks, Jeremiah, and hello, everyone. Yeah, I'm Joe Andrews. I'm head of sales for Africa for SIS Betting. Um, SIS Betting are a content creator, a rights holder, and a supplier of um, content to the betting industry and operators all over the world. Obviously, my focus is on the African continent, something I'm very passionate about. Um, we have three main product verticals, really. One is live and real horse and greyhound races from around the world. The others uh, are UK 49s and associated numbers products. And the one... Uh, more relevant to this, I'd say, is the CIS competitive gaming product, which is our esports content produced specifically for betting operators. And that includes FIFA, NBA, and we've recently launched CSGO as well. Um, so, yeah, that's me and, and SIS in a nutshell. Beautiful, beautiful. Max? Yeah. Hello, 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 guys. My name is Max. I'm a chief operating officer at Bed Bazaar. Uh, but Bazaar, well known as a iGaming a marketplace, so we help clients to to find the best product in the market, and we especially focusing on esports and uh, sports content. So especially uh, on uh, FIFA, also NBA and global esports data feed. So that's why I believe we can help and uh, to share some thoughts about this topic. Yeah, awesome, awesome. And I like, I kind of like the chair you're sitting on because it is uh, very familiar to uh, yeah. the esports studios out here. So uh, very, very introductory, uh, interesting uh, top point there. So uh, we move next to uh, Ronnie. Please introduce yourself. Uh, thank you very much, Jeremiah. And nice to be here with uh, Joe and Max. My name is Ronnie Lusigi. I'm speaking to you from Nairobi, Kenya, where I'm based. I'm the CEO at Index G Esports. Index G Esports is an esports organization operating in East Africa. Um, we are focused mainly on conducting esports events and competitions, uh, also creating esports content. We've done some esports films uh, around esports stars in, in, in Kenya just to spread the awareness in that regard. We also focused on capacity building for players and industry players in the esports scene. So thank you very much, Jeremiah, and I'm happy to be here with Joe and Max, and I'm hoping for a wonderful conversation. Yeah, thanks, Ronnie. Thank you, thank you. Nice, nice. Thank you very much for that introduction. Just a, rem a, a reminder to our audience that uh, this session has been sponsored by Pragmatic Play. And we are happy to be having you all listening in. Remember that you can also uh, share questions or ask any questions to our audience, even as we begin this conversation. So um, I think, uh, Joe, uh, I'll put the first question towards you because uh, uh, the esports industry is uh, quite growing. Uh, there has uh, there is now a massive uh, massive growth. I think after after crash games this is going to be the biggest uh, uh, topic that people are going to be talking about. And what uh, has it that uh, over 100 million people watch uh, League of Legends, for example, per month? Uh, this is another very exciting and very popular game. Uh, and also we have Dota 2, uh, which is uh, uh, having at least over $9 million dollars given to winners in a competition uh, that happened in key arena in Seto. Um, so this uh, is another point that uh, it's a sport that we have to 
look at because if uh, a winner in an esports game can uh, win nine million and this is just one team nine million dollars uh, then this means that uh, this is a sport that uh, people must take very very seriously and so somebody might ask uh, what uh, this esports is because uh, maybe you might be having a, a guest who doesn't really know uh, much about esports can you uh, kindly explain to uh, to us in a layman's language what uh, esports is and why this game is gaining uh, so much popularity in the recent times yeah sure i mean just by its definition i mean esports is the professional element of playing multiplayer computer games as you've just said that you know there's money to be won people can pay to go and watch these events and there's great money to be made if you're a professional whereas you know your standard video games is just any of us playing multiplayer games online and it's the sort of amateur aspect but obviously that's crucial to feeding the professional side you know you've got to start somewhere and I think that's why it's so popular as well because it's it's so accessible obviously there is a cost barrier to entry of getting consoles and things like that but anyone can play the games um you know, as with a lot of things, COVID has accelerated the growth of, of esports. There's been a need for entertainment, um, social interaction, uh, and with it being easier for people to connect online now, it's just it's just become you know a really popular event. You've obviously you've mentioned some of the big games there, but CS:GO one of the most popular um, because that can be played on a variety of platforms: um, PC, Xbox, PlayStation, etc. Um, but you've also got Call of Duty, you know, Free Fire. I know in Africa in particular, they're, you know, big fans of uh, of the fighting game, Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat and things like that as well. So, um, you know, that, that that's the difference. It, it's it, it's just massive. You know, it's, it appeals to the younger generation. And I know just sort of one more thing. I mean, speaking from um, an iGaming point of view, a betting point of view, esports has been a buzzword now and people have been talking about it for probably sort of five six years you know it was identified as something new and exciting that could maybe introduce new players to a sports book and create a new brand vertical on the sports book that, that just wasn't there before it was brand new but but i'd say only a handful of operators have actually made it work and, and there's quite a lot um, that are still reluctant to embrace esports but when it comes to being you know an expert on esports i'm probably still a bit of a dinosaur myself but i can certainly see the, the positives of it as a betting medium um, and to engage new customers and to cross sell to existing betters as well so that's what we've been trying to do here at sis when we've been creating as i said earlier fifa nba csgo you know what we're finding is when we put fifa in the football tab we're, we're seeing up to 10 percent growth in revenue on the on the whole football book you know if you put it in the right place and and that's really important to to sports books and, and growing revenues um so yeah it's it's exciting it's an exciting time for esports i think certainly in africa yeah and actually uh, you are doing a very good job at uh, sis and i realize that you are actually having a an internally made studio at sis and uh, you are actually even having um, uh, referees who are coming into the studios and uh, checking what the players are doing. How are you managing to do this? Uh, and are you having any other uh, authorities like uh, government authorities or people from uh, the gambling boards inspecting uh, also uh, the, the kind of um, uh, environment that these players are playing in and just to ensure that there is a credibility with the sport? Yeah. How are you managing to ensure that uh, whatever uh, the sports book are getting from your end is actually something that they can trust? Because they, they are not present at uh, the studios. It's just you uh, as SIS. Do you have any other representatives who are monitoring this? Yeah, a really good question, Jeremiah. I mean, we're actually a member of ESIC, which is the International Esports Integrity Committee. And we're the only supplier of this kind of content that's actually been awarded the gold standard because of the high integrity standards that we do have. Um, as you said, I think we're the only supplier that actually of this content that actually has a referee in the middle. Um, and it's not just for show. The, the referee is monitoring the players. You know, we've got really strict rules. The players, when they come in, they don't know who they're they're going to play throughout the day until they see the schedule. Their phones are put away and locked away. The, the referee, him or herself, is, as I said, monitoring the play, but also in direct contact with our trading team who are sending out the prices and, and looking at the games. And then our trading team are in, in direct contact with our operators and, and members of the operators' trading teams or sports book teams or whatever like that. So in terms of a betting product, you know, there isn't many more controlled products out there you know people talk about tennis and and basketball and things like this where there's been integrity breaches but 
but only something like this where the, is the betting operator actually able to speak to us and say, we're seeing some strange betting patterns here. Can you pull the player? Can you do this? And we can react instantly. So I think in terms of a betting medium, it's it's fully controlled. You know, integrity is the number one thing I get asked when, when I'm talking to people about this product, first thing they ask. Um, and I think we've done an amazing job with it. And ultimately, if people don't trust the product, either the operators or the end punter, they're not going to bet on it. So that's the important thing. You know, there is no betting product if people don't trust it. Um, and we also need to make sure you know, the, the players are, the players are paid. They're bonus to win. Um, you know, they're incentivized to win and do their best. And, and the trading team and the guys that run the product are making sure that the players are, are very well matched to create good odds and competitive games from the first whistle to, to the last. So um, all that stuff you mentioned is is really important. And I think we do a great job on it for sure. Yeah, yeah. I believe you're doing a good job and I will be happy to see uh, one studio in Africa very soon. So uh, <laughs> I think the next one will be to um, uh, uh, Ronnie. Ronnie um, uh, speaks esports from uh, Monday to Monday. Uh, this is what he does for a living. Um, he's a CEO uh, uh, and they are planning uh, or organizing several esports events, especially here in Africa. So, but uh, there is something that comes into mind. In a nutshell, uh, Ronnie, Esports players are professional athletes just like any other athletes from any other sports. Uh, and they are, they are sponsored by companies and their teams are at times uh, owned by multi-billionaire investors or multi-billion investors across the world. Now, taking this to account and uh, bringing it into Africa, Ronnie, uh, uh, do you think that uh, this sport is being taken seriously in Africa? And if so, which are some of the African countries that uh, you believe have uh, demonstrated a strong um, interest and reception for these kind of games? And uh, what factors are leading to this or shaping the trend? Uh, and then you can tell us then uh, finally, based on your findings, if you believe that uh, we as Africa are well primed for the esports boom that we just talked about, that esports is the next big thing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremiah, for, for those el elaborate questions. And uh, uh, I'd begin by saying that esports does not operate in a vacuum. Uh, for you to understand esports or for, for you to contextualize it, you need to look at the supporting industries or related industries, maybe like entertainment and sports, and look at them in Africa and say, what is the position or what is the state of um, sports in general, traditional sports? And entertainment and how that now piggies back to to esports because uh, you've asked a very good question of which African countries and see esports the growth of esports is influenced by a lot of things uh, around around the video gaming industry itself that supports it so I'd say I think South Africa uh, have done well uh, traditionally they've been the leading ones but you can see countries like Morocco. Uh, coming up really strongly. But when I say these other factors, there are factors that influence this, you say like South Africa has been the home for most of these video gaming companies when they come to set up office in Africa. They first set up in South Africa. So you find even the few servers, the video gaming servers that in, are in Africa are based in South Africa. So traditionally, yes, they did have a head start over other African countries. Because when you have these industry players invest in your country, it's easy to have this conversation with related industries, either endemic or non-endemic, for them to support the industry. So for, for other African countries, you see you are starting from scratch. Of course, there is the huge video gaming culture across Africa. And now you have a base that you can build on it. Also, uh, you have to look at things like the costs of equipment that influences the growth of esports in Africa, but both in a positive and a negative way. Because uh, in Africa, most of sub saharan Africa, you'll find that video gaming cafes are the go-to places for people taking part in video gaming and transiting to the competitive side of, of esports. That has really helped because there is a culture of people coming together to play and watch video games. So transiting that into esports events, you have already a foundation. So it may have started as a lack that brought people together in video gaming cafes because not everyone can afford the equipment. 
But now that becomes an advantage because you have pockets of people coming together to watch and play video games. And when you bring that together, you are able to do proper esports events. So I'd say uh, South Africa really are leading because of the private investment that is there. Morocco now are coming up because you can see their government now putting in uh, uh, putting in money into the esports federation there. I recently set up there to host events, to host summits. But for other African countries, uh, I'd say Nigeria is also Nigeria is also doing well hosting uh, esports competitions. Uh, in this east side, you'll say Kenya, uh, not because I'm Kenya, <laughs> but Kenya really is, is, is a leading one in this region. But you have to look at those factors because, again, in most of sub saharan Africa, sports has not been privatized. Sports is mainly done by government parastatals having teams as part of CSR, corporates having teams as part of CSR. But esports demands that most of what we do, you, you have to privatize it. So you, you find even the conversations with would-be sponsors are difficult because they're not used to the commercial side of the conversation. They are used to the CSR side of the conversation when it's soccer, when it's athletics, when it's rugby. So when you, you bring to them this commercial side that esports brings, sometimes it, it affects that. But really, I'd say the future is promising. Many organizations are coming up across the continent and it's all just to hope that they be sustainable for esports to grow. Thank you, Jeremiah. Uh, good, good. Um, uh, you've touched on uh, very, very key points that um, uh, are quite uh, very, very interesting to note. And uh, you mentioned uh, Kenya, you mentioned uh, Morocco, you've mentioned South Africa, but there are some other countries in Africa. Africa, you know, is made up of uh, over 50 countries. Um, uh, and why is it that we are not seeing this growth uh, projected across the entire continent? Because, uh, Joe, uh, I'll give you, for example, in 2016, uh, the World Championship for League of Legends attracted over 43 million viewers online, and the prize pool was over $6 million. Can you imagine that? Now, uh, and now the worst part is that uh, if, if you try to do some uh, deep research, you might even realize that um, out of these, uh, uh, all these people who watched uh, or followed the game online is a very, very small percentage that is coming from Africa, coming from a, a, an events uh, uh, industry or from a, uh, because you run an events company. What do you think is uh, uh, bringing this uh, uh, slow uh, adoption or rate? Because uh, the rate is happening, yes, and it's only happening in a few countries like Kenya, South Africa, uh, uh, Nigeria. These are the countries that you talk about every time you are talking about the tech or some, some good innovation that is uh, coming uh, towards Africa. Why are we not seeing the other countries or what is the, uh, the issue? Because it's an industry that can really be helpful to us. A hundred percent. And, you know, around about 60 percent of Africa's population is under 25, which is massive. You've got, you know, you've got 700 million people circa that have Internet access. The potential in Africa is absolutely massive. It is absolutely massive and people need to embrace it. But to answer your question, I mean, the problem is there, there are still barriers to entry and challenges. You know, you've got expensive consoles um, and equipment. Ronnie mentioned that the cafes and stuff, which help massively, and they're needed because, you know, not everyone can buy an Xbox or a PC with, with broadband. You know, internet speeds are a problem. You know, power cuts. You've got with it with esports high ping time. So that's the time between when a player can press a button and the action actually happening on screen, which, which can be an issue. Um, so... You know that there are challenges, but I think, you know, the main one is 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 the barrier to entry of cost, which is where the governments and you know these esports federations in other uh, fledgling countries looking at esports need to really help out the players and encourage them to take part and participate in these events. You know, if they can't at home. That's correct. And actually, oh, I just want uh, I just want to uh, to add a little bit uh, to to your words and your words. I'm definitely sure that if you want to actually to create an ecosystem and uh, in, in, in esports ecosystem, so you need to invest not only uh, opening some um, 
uh, offline facilities or studios. Yeah, you have to invest to um, education of audience, help uh, to encourage. I, I, I totally agree with you on this case uh, to provide some uh, government rules uh, to regulate uh, the market and to, to to help to increase the popular popularity of esports. And I believe uh, if we actually analyze the population and the age group yeah in the world so um we have like more than i believe two and a half billion uh people under 20 yeah and uh, the the second the second age group from 20 to 39 it's also like two billion people and actually this is the audience for esports the most uh, uh, interesting players who uh, play esports, professional players, it's like 23, 25 years old. So I believe this is audience which should be attracted to this industry uh, and um, actually educated. Uh, so, yeah, in, in this case, I believe this is uh, also a good approach to create an ecosystem, not just a separate, uh, separate uh, let's say, business for esports. And actually, it's good that you've mentioned about uh, the age group because uh, esports, we know there is a special uh, age uh, limit, maybe if I can use that word, or there is a special group of people in a specific age group that play esports games. And we know these are the people between the ages of 18 uh, to maybe 30 or 35 maximum. And when you come to Africa, you tend to realize that. Uh, Africa, at the moment, is the youngest continent in the world. This yeah. is a proven fact. And if this is so then, and a good number of young people in Africa are already into esports or video gaming. However, not many have thought of becoming professional esports players. This can be attributed to lack of maybe facilities and the technology to take their skills to another level. So, Max, um, um, I think now we need to ask ourselves these questions. Eh? Uh, can esports games now uh, build a career, uh, like a long term career for players, uh, or uh, make a full time career or be a full time career for a player? And if, if this is the case, then how can this be made practical, especially in Africa? Because we are fighting with the high unemployment rate at the moment in almost all the countries and considering that uh, now like everything everybody is moving online if you look at the rates at which uh, uh, people are TikToking, for example or people are moving towards twitch uh, to produce content and uh, they are making money uh, now can we bring this to the side of esports uh, we have so many players we have but most of them are uh, doing uh, video games or they are doing these games but for fun how can we yeah. change this perspective or this narrative it, it's really a good question and uh, a tough uh, but um, esports can indeed offer full-time careers for players and uh, through tournaments winnings through uh, streaming revenue and sponsorship but one of the issues I believe uh, Africa right now is it, the connectivity, so the penetration of the internet. Of course, South Africa on the first place, um, even in uh, Nigeria and Kenya, um, it's almost uh, good in terms of uh, internet penetration. But uh, in other countries, this is a problem. So um, it, it's one of the issues. And uh, the second issue is creating, um, let's say, some facilities yes yeah, some educational program for um, young generation to help to improve their skills to um, to play to using in to use their knowledge in computer science because of course world world right now is changing really fast and more than 70 percent i believe of the population in the world has access to internet so uh, we are mostly all online and this is the next level of um, <laughs> of our development and development uh, our our world. Uh, so Africa infrastructure, so Africa should increase um, and improve infrastructure. Uh, so then 
um, using some professional esports education. And of course, you need the governmental support uh, because it's necessary to combat high use and employment uh, that you mentioned. And, uh, you know, if to talk about the actually role uh, in youth development, uh, the Esports now plays a crucial role in this, fostering key skills uh, as a strategic thinking, as teamwork, as problem solving, and actually it improves digital literacy and uh, essential skills in today's technology-driven world. So that's why, that's why what you... I understand that this is difficult, yeah. Uh, this is difficult in terms of country, uh, how to improve it. But this is the key point, uh, to improve infrastructure, to improve uh, the connectivity, to provide some educational support uh, and, and uh, actually using some educational program, open different facilities or academies for esports players. This, I believe, uh, could solve this issue. Yeah, and uh, that point is uh, very true. But now, where does the help come from? Uh, because uh, uh, one of the areas that we can get help from is uh, government. Number two is infest investors. Uh, but it is a fact that uh, uh, proper reg regulation for the sport is lacking in Africa. And African leaders and regulators need to take uh, esports games seriously, first, first of all, before there can uh, uh, only be limited access of the sport in the continent, if there is uh, anything to go by that. So um, this now Max, uh, uh, puts us uh, in a situation whereby we are trying to look at how the sport is uh, uh, regulated or countries in Africa that are kind of closer to regulating the sport. And uh, for example, in Africa, uh, the Confederation of Africa for Esports that was formally constituted in 2007 has only five members, uh, member states. That is Egypt, Namibia, Nigeria, mm -hmm. South Africa, and Tunisia. Uh, what does th this uh, speak towards the readiness of uh, African countries taking uh, the sport seriously, especially from the regulation side? Because if there is regulation, if we see governments putting aside some money in their budget for the development of esports infrastructure, then we will see that there is some kind of seriousness. But now if you only have five countries that have shown some interest in kind of uh, regulating uh, or being ready to regulate the sport, then how, how, what, what does this speak uh, uh, towards the readiness of the continent? So actually, uh, it's a good question. And uh, uh, I think that we also have forgotten some interesting points. So uh, the business, yeah, the business point in terms of companies who are working uh, in Africa region and uh, can help uh, to educate um, and to invest uh, to growth of esports. And But also we need to take consideration that to invest to esports and to understand esports, you have to... Uh, learn yeah, something and to understand how it differs from uh, the real sports. Why is sports so popular? What is esports in, uh, in details, like classic uh, games like CSGO, Dota 2, uh, League of Legends, Valorant, uh, console games like FIFA, NBA, and so on. So it, you have to, to understand clearly and especially for gov government, yeah, they need to understand it clearly. Uh, for this, they should have at least people who are excited, who are like gaming enthusiasts, who are excited about esports, who know the players, who know the teams, who know how to organize uh, some events, how uh, how to attract uh, the audience, how to educate um, players, and this is, I believe, the the crucial part. Sometimes you can't convince uh, someone uh, even to uh, launch the esports product because there is no understanding. What is this? What is the value? Uh, what we can do with that in the future? Uh, what will be the uh, like uh, revenue turnover or 
something else. In this case, uh, I understand your point that now you have only, like, let's say, five countries yeah, who invested in this field. But believe me, this is uh, uh, the crucial and the most important step for now. It's essential step because uh, then year to year you will see the increasing of uh, popularity you uh, you will see the additional investments from uh, let's say even sports book operators in the africa region who now recognize the sport as uh, a potential uh, for them to invest so so we need to uh, we need to act from different fields and create the ecosystem inside the country Yeah, a good just point, add, a good point. I, yes, yes. Let sure. me just add, Jeremiah, that uh, when it comes to regulation, really, uh, it's very difficult to, to, to regulate esports. I think we should be more focused on creating the enabling environment because you mentioned the thing with the African Federation and <clears throat> that is the challenge because you'll find there are three, four, five African Federations around esports. Even globally, <clears throat> you'll find there are several federations around esports. So it's really that, unlike traditional sports, you cannot say you are coming to regulate and to govern. For me, it's just to focus more on having an enabling environment. From a national level, it's just ensuring things like the players' welfare, uh, that you don't have tournament organizers uh, fleecing players. You want to ensure that players of the right age are competing in the right regulated games. You want to ensure that other people in the ecosystem around video gaming and esports are also getting their value and their rightful value. So it really should be focused on having an enabling environment more than, say, regulating, because unlike soccer or other sports, here the game is not owned by a federation. The game is owned by a publisher, and each and every publisher have their several reasons for creating their games. And it goes back to what you're asking, Joe, about why we don't have those big events. It's because the distance between the African video gaming community and the publishers is so huge. So you, the first investor to having esports events and an esports ecosystem is usually the publisher in the advanced markets. But still, maybe because of the lack of data, enough data in Africa, they don't see value in uh, in doing events in Africa. Good, good. And I understand that uh, recently, actually, Ronnie, you hosted an event in Nairobi, and uh, we would like to understand um, uh, some of the comments you were receiving from the players and from those who attended. Uh, like, do they see that there is a, a future or a good future in the industry and can you give us uh, roughly estimates uh, of uh, how the attendance looked like? Uh, that is from the player side and uh, from basically those who came to witness the, the event, because that also speaks a lot towards our readiness, towards adopting the game. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeremiah, once again. Um, as I've said, I think I usually like to compare uh, <clears throat> esports and athletics. Uh, running, a lot of people do run, especially in uh, athletic spouse of a country like Kenya, but only a few do it professionally. Then they become the elite Kipchoges, they become the world record breakers. It's the same as video gaming. A lot of Kenyans do play video games. Of course, we have a challenge in, in data around that, uh, um, knowing the exact number of players, but there's a huge video gaming culture already in our country. It's now up to the question of can we convert this video gaming culture into a viable esports industry? So uh, in terms of the, the recent event we had, it was the game around it was FIFA. Again, you have to understand uh, popularity of games differ with market, differ with countries. I found that console games are the most popular in Kenya and in most parts of the continent. So... Um, in, in, the, in, the, in the attendance we, we had, because it was a small venue, we had close to 400 people coming in person to, to watch the event. But the participation itself, uh, we had, uh, that's above 260 
participants playing in the competition. We also had good support, having support from the, the French embassy, having support from uh, the Kenyan's Ministry of Sport, and having support from a few corporates here and there. And also the viewership was good. We, we did uh, slightly above 3,500 viewership on YouTube and on TikTok. The, the feed exploded. We are doing above 200,000 views on TikTok for the feed, especially the final match. So I'd say the appetite for esports events is there. The appetite for viewership of esports content is there. What now the gap that is there is the investment into this type of events and uh, because there are very many small sized events being done in, in video gaming cafes but you know to get the attention of the right people we have to move out and to go to these big arenas to go to these uh, universities to go to these halls and to do these uh, mega esports events at, at the moment i wouldn't say as a video gaming organizer as, as an event organ esports events organizer that you make that profit but we need to put in this investment where we do more and more of these mega events because it's the mega events that talk to those people who need to be aware of what esports is so that they stop seeing it in the same way they see it uh, as a cyber cafe where people go and browse in the internet. They should know that this is a viable way uh, of people and also to understand the entire ecosystem. You are speaking about unemployment because in doing these esports events, we have videographers who get some income. We have photographers. We have people in security. We have people doing the, the stage setup. We have people doing the, the graphic design for, for us. So you end up employing a lot and lots of people. In this event alone, we, we, are, we, are, we are working with over 50 people just to ensure that the event is going on smoothly. So again, esports events helps you uh, spread the awareness because when you bring when you start bringing in these people like people some people in the corporate were were shocked to see the french ambassador was there uh, they saw the ministry of sports and representatives when you bring these people who maybe you've been writing proposals to and they don't understand esports when you bring them to such live esports events that is your pitch that's better than any pitch you can you can present on a laptop so i'd really say there's an appetite for esports events in Kenya. I've also been to Nigeria, the wonderful job people in Game Are Africa are doing. And you see there again, people attending in their thousands uh, just to come and watch other people play video games and to be part of that vibe. But the gap that is lacking right now is the investment into these kinds of events so that we can have them in a more frequent manner. We can have three or four mega national events in a year. Uh, just to, to take it a notch higher. Yeah, yeah, and a uh, very important point you've uh, brought out is uh, especially on the point of uh, the opportunities that uh, this is going to create for the African uh, continent and especially for the young people. Uh, you saw what is happening. I, I believe you've checked out what is happening in Kenya right now. Uh, where we had um, uh, this um, cryptocurrency coin, world, uh, world coin, and uh, they were doing uh, some signups and uh, giving some free tokens for whoever was signing up. And uh, when people, or uh, especially the young people who I saw queuing, uh, realized that uh, they are just uh, scanning their iris uh, to verify that they are humans, and they were being given um, uh, tokens, uh, which when uh, swapped with the famous uh, USDT coin, they were getting around uh, $58 uh, in crypto. And they could uh, trade this in the P2P uh, uh, market on uh, popular exchanges and uh, cash it out as a uh, real cash. And so, so many people were into this. And if I can translate this uh, and... Uh, uh, try to see if all these people, if all these young people would realize uh, that there are other opportunities that don't just come once and they go. Like uh, esports is a skill. If you train yourself, you become good. Uh, you can earn a living and you can, you can um, make some good cash. So uh, uh, maybe a lot of sensitization needs to be done. A lot of uh, education, as Max said, 
uh, and not just educating the players or those who can join the industry as players, but also educating um, uh, the regulators. Like in Sigma last year, uh, we had a panel discussion about esports, and the regulator was there, uh, but this is a regulator of the gambling sector in Kenya. And then after the session, uh, uh, one of them walked uh, directly to me, and then they were like, I've not heard about esports. Uh, so what is this? Can you please tell me what esports is? And I was like, uh, this is now the way we should have this kind of uh, conversation. So uh, Joe, uh, uh, I know uh, uh, you will be good to uh, answer this one, uh, but this is uh, an article. In, uh, there is an article that was uh, written by Ronnie, who, is, uh, who uh, publishes some articles on uh, the Daily Nation in Kenya. And Ronnie advised parents not to stop their children from playing esports games. Um, uh, it's, it's a proven fact that uh, esports players who start playing young and end up being very strong in the, uh, they end up being very strong in this career. Furthermore, it's becoming more and more common for universities abroad uh, 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 treating esports competitors as other athletes to the extent that they are offering them scholarships uh, to come and study in their universities. Um, uh, they know very well that a successful team can boost the university's prestige on an international level. So you can see the seriousness that is being taken up by universities abroad. So Joe, um, can you please tell us um, what advice you can give to parents who have identified a special skill, especially uh, uh, with the, their, their kids having a skill uh, of playing video games or esports, because you know here in Africa, what used to happen when you are when you you are uh, immediately you came from school, you could rush to um, we call them playstations to go and play FIFA, and then I, I I remember one day my father found me there, and I I had to explain. Uh, why I was not doing homework. <laughs> Instead, uh, I decided to go and play FIFA. So uh, what can you give, uh, or what advice can you, Joe, give to parents who have, real, who have come to realize that their kids are too much into video gaming or uh, uh, the like? Yeah, I'm not sure I'm sure someone that should be given any parental advice, to be <laughs> honest. But um, I think the, 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 the overlying message to parents is this is a serious profession with a, with a viable career path and if you think you've got a child that, that's gifted and, and good at games the best thing that you can do as with anything is support them in their in their ventures you know try and find out where they can test their skills you know either online or, or a local competition um you know if they continue to excel at that level just find that career path for them you know and find the the, the way that they can get better and get recognized um you know we touched on it then with Ronnie and stuff. It's not just playing games, actually. They might have a love of esports in general, but they might be outgoing. You know, they might be able to create content or become a broadcaster on YouTube. That's a viable career path now for, for youngsters. Uh, maybe they've got entrepreneurial traits um, and they could organize local tournaments themselves. You know, if they're not a player, maybe they could start doing that and bringing gamers together. Um, so as I said, you know, take take this career path seriously. It's not just your kid wasting time playing FIFA or playing games when they should be doing their homework. I mean, the, the examples are out there. You've got people like Queen Arrow, who's a Kenyan player. I'm sure you, you know who she is. You know, she was in the Forbes Africa 30 under 30 list. Um, she's one best player. She's she's really good at Tekken and, and Mortal Kombat and things like that. I think she actually played for a British team for a short while um, last year. You know, she's sponsored by Red Bull. So not only does she get paid to play, she, her sponsorships are coming in because of her following and her, and her reach. You've got a South African streamer, Grant Hines, who's got over 35,000 YouTube subscribers. And as a result, because he's got that audience, he can sell sponsorships and he's done stuff with Red Bull, Xbox, you know, just general advertising. And then these people are making a lot of money out of esports now in Africa. And, and again, as you said, that this is really important for job creation in Africa in, in general. You know, unemployment is, is an issue. It, it, the rise in esports is, you know, with the younger generation, they're going to be skilled in this area, highly skilled. And you might not understand it, but 
it's estimated that by 2025, esports in Africa will be responsible for employing 1 million people. So it's important that not only parents realise that, but the governments recognise that this is a new sector. It's 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 flourishing and you need to support it and encourage people to get involved because it will create jobs and wealth as well in, in your countries. And also, sorry, Jeremiah, just one last thing. It is important. You, you mentioned about um, esports being part of a national curriculum or part of universities. Having a successful esports team on, say, FIFA, it's no different to going to watch, you know, the, the, the guys play football or rugby at university, uh, which people go and do and they celebrate the success of the sports teams. You know, esports would be no different. I did see that there were plans to introduce some sort of secondary school level education on esports in, in Nigeria. And hopefully that will follow in um, in other parts of Africa as well, because I think that's really, really important. Yeah, Joe, you've uh, you've touched uh, on a very important point, and uh, I'm happy that you brought in the issue of um, high schools and universities, because this is where most of these young people um, uh, are found out. So if we wanted actually to double the rates at which the adoption uh, for these sports is taking, uh, then uh, most of those facilities should be set up, according to me, in universities and high schools, because this is where this population is. However, uh, and, and I believe this is already happening uh, across the world, uh, but when you come to Africa, the case is uh, kind of different. Like yesterday, I, I like to bring you to book uh, to what was happening in Kenya, is that uh, the president uh, launched, uh, that's the Kenyan president launched an open university where uh, studying is going to be purely digital. And uh, the rate, th this is actually uh, uh, just a move to ensure that more, um, more, 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 more people uh, get opportunities to acquire uh, degrees or certificates or uh, diplomas. But now, uh, when you look at the curriculum, you realize that uh, it's purely theory, economics, uh, business, uh, mathematics, this is what they are going to be studying. But uh, there is kind of uh, some laxity when it comes to courses like sports science or the likes. Maybe they will introduce them, maybe they have them, but uh, or they have them in queue. But this is not being seen, and not just in the open university, but in other institutions. So, um, uh, Ronnie, why do you think that uh, uh, universities that I believe are having people who are doing research? Because if there is somewhere that this should have started from, is from universities, because we believe that uh, one role uh, that universities uh, play is uh, uh, research. And it's not just research uh, for uh, medicine or, uh, for, or, or for business or the likes. It should be even research on how we can end the unemployment issue that is eating up the African continent. So why do you think that uh, uh, universities in Africa are not taking the sport seriously enough to put up esports facilities or to uh, kind of attract investors who can help in setting up such infrastructures which are kind of expensive sometimes to set up uh, uh, despite the fact that majority of gamers attend these institutions uh, uh, why do you think this is the case uh, it, it should go back to where we started jeremiah you must look at the historical factors how we have treated sports and entertainment in kenya or in the african continent uh, uh, as a whole when i finished my high school I intended to do sports management. But at that time, in the entire country, only one university was offering sport management as a course. So I had to go and do physical education and sport, where half of it is training to be a PE teacher, and the other part of it is now learning aspects in sports management. So from uh, traditionally, we've not had even sports treated as an industry in, in, the, in the African continent. Sports is not treated as a as a commercially viable industry. Sports has many occupy the realm of CSR, of a social activity, which there's nothing wrong with that. But many people have looked at sports as really not an industry worth it. 
sports and entertainment, that's why you'll find very few universities having courses, either short courses or fully-fledged courses on sports and, and, and entertainment. So if you have that background, it's difficult now to expect the same universities to be strong in esports. We have a few universities who've done well, especially private universities, when it comes to sports. And that is why recently we are proud to, to unveil uh, an, an esports facility at Mount Kenya University, who at least the administration have bought a few consoles for, for them to set up an esports team and to recognize esports as a co curricular activity. But yes, we need to go a notch higher. But as I always repeat, these factors are affected by other factors around us. How have these universities treated sports? How have they treated entertainment? What is the what is the commercial value even of the university games if you're speaking of traditional sports? What is the commercial value of the university entertainment scene, pagan shows and, and, and other things? So all these things come will come to affect the way we treat esports. So I just think we are in an awareness journey. The biggest thing we can do right now, as Max has said, is to push in a lot in the awareness part. And that's why even personally, I took up the responsibility of being an, an esports columnist um, with the Daily Nation uh, newspaper here in Kenya, because I, we really need to write more and more and more about it. Because even this awareness is both internal and external. Uh, you speak to people externally, they downgrade the value of esports in our continent. Like, because if I'm buying a game, I use a USD account. If I'm buying a console, I use a USD account. I have to open an account. It's like I'm staying in Europe or in South Africa. It affects us when it comes to collecting this data. But we must not tire. We should all continue, continue spreading this awareness in terms of esports and the video gaming space in the continent. And that's the only thing that will make uh, these important institutions like educational institutions and corporate entities take note of esports and put in their support. We must also train the talent that is there in esports because most of us in esports are young people who are trying out. We also need that education to be able to offer also these people who are coming into esports the value, the return in the investment that they are making. And to do that, you need skilled people who can do events properly, skilled people who can give value back to these people putting value in, in the esports scene. Yeah, very, 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 very true. Um, uh, it's, it's true. What we can do at the moment is um, uh, use whatever we have as we hope for the best. And whatever you are doing, um, uh, Ronnie, is good because uh, it's also playing a role in uh, educating the public about esports and why they need to take them uh, seriously. We have a comment here from one Ankit uh, Hiroar. Uh, from India, and uh, she says that um, uh, same happens in India about esports. Uh, life uh, should, of course, be balanced, so we must take care of both studies and their playing skills. I believe um, Ankit is responding to the question we asked about uh, parents kind of uh, uh, giving their children or their kids an opportunity to practice their skills, especially to do with Esports, and then um, uh, 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 you know, Joe and Max, you realize that uh, most uh, sports books or sports betting companies, to be specific, are now uh, having uh, esports as one of the sports that players can wager on, and uh, this uh, is uh, something that is happening almost with almost all. Uh, the companies. And now this brings us to the, C the CSR part because if gamers uh, or players from Africa are uh, betting on this uh, content or betting on these games, then maybe the, the, it should be a responsibility also to companies that are producing this content to uh, kind of play a role in giving back to the society by uh, supporting in uh, improving the level of standard uh, for the sport so that we can have an, uh, an environment whereby the sport can thrive. So um, this is why we have this question, what role 
can operate us. That is those uh, sports books which are projecting this uh, content and those who are developing and organizations that are uh, providing this content uh, like Bet Baza, uh, which uh, uh, Max represents and SIS Limited, which Joe represents. So what role do you think uh, the companies can play in ensuring that the growth of uh, the sport is uh, realized, especially in Africa? Uh, we can start with uh, Max and then you go to Joe. Yeah. Thank you, Jeremy, for this question. Actually, uh, well, when I listen to Ronnie, I believe uh, this is the main in insight uh, from our today's conversation. So we have uh, a fantastic gig esports enthusiast yeah who who believe in esports who do everything in his country uh, to improve the esports to find uh, to organize some events to educate um, to educate actually audience for it and so on so i believe that in this case uh, the best uh, the best options and the best opportunity should be a cooperation yeah with operators uh, who will actually should contribute to growth um, in esports uh, in Africa, especially invest in, in local talent. So, because I believe you can find a lot of local talents uh, in Africa who are passionate about esports, providing uh, high quality content as well. So, um, hosting tournaments, it, uh, and uh, also, of course, it's about sponsorship. So, if we find it, if we find a talent, so we create a team, we can sponsor the team in Africa, and so this team can represent the whole country uh, on the tournaments. So, and this will bring some uh, attention to uh, to esports at the discipline and uh, to the country at the one of the most. Uh, yeah, popular let's say popular like young youngest country who can provide us with some uh, talented person in esports and of course uh, i believe um, in terms of operator and sportsbook operator they also can influence on partnership with government bodies so uh, and regulations to provide some regulation rules and to create um, inside the country some academies or uh, some facilities or even studios for such game and providing a possibility to find a job and to build a career uh, in the esports industry. So, yeah. Good, good, good points. Good points, Joe. Yeah, all, all good points by, by Max. Um, I, I do agree. I mean, it's slightly different for us, obviously, because our content is only accessible on, on bookmakers' websites. But it does still st stimulate the interest in eSport and, again, demonstrates that there are other career paths involved in eSports which people can go down and be successful at. I mean, the, the only other thing to, to add what Max has already said is that, you know, in some jurisdictions around the world, we have worked with, um, you know, lawmakers or or, the, the, you know, the license givers, you know, for example, Padcor in the Philippines, who we're speaking to about getting esports enabled for betting operators um, and to demonstrate the commercial value and the interest that could be had, um, you know, not just on the operator sites, but generally in the ecosystem and, and people getting involved in esports. So we, you know, even as a company SIS, we'd be more than happy to get involved with those conversations, uh, um, sort of a national level, anywhere, if it might benefit, you know, esports um, and our product, but also the general esports ecosystem and, and really pushing things forward there. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. And uh, to end the conversation on a good note, um, is uh, some news that came out from uh, the Nigeria esports team, uh, which is um, called uh, Citizens Gaming. Uh, uh, they were invited uh, to, Saudi, uh, to Saudi Arabia Championship, and uh, the team is going to be taking part in that uh, tournament. So uh, I believe that this is uh, good news. We should see more of this. And... Uh, actually, apart from us being invited, I'm looking forward to an African Continental Esports Championship uh, uh, happening and 
uh, this is just the, one of the ways that we can shape or sharpen the sport, especially here in Africa. Well, I Jeremiah, that be... could I just ask something then? There's the African Cup of yeah, Nations yeah, is coming probably. up soon, and Ronnie may know this as well. Is there going to be an esports competition that replicates the African Cup of Nations for FIFA? Uh, Joe, it's something we are trying to push because you must find the balance between the rights holder of the of the assets, Afcon, and the publisher, uh, most probably eSports or Konami. So it's something mm -hmm. we are pushing for because it must demonstrate the assets of Afcon in the game because they won't want, as, pro as presently constituted, those games don't have Afcon assets. So they won't want to, to, to have that competition with that. But it's something we are pushing uh, to have uh, CAF um, recognize it. And we hopefully in the next uh, few years, it's something that will be able to happen. But you understand uh, the balance that is there. What license will they be giving to the publisher? How will they value the license? And will the publisher agree with the valuation of the, of the license? You saw the, 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 the issue with FIFA that, that they had. Uh, recently and uh, so when it comes to to federation sometimes they go slower but we hope for the best soon well i wish you all the best because that would be a really exciting addition to the esports calendar in africa you know we've obviously seen the success of the three african women's teams as well in the in the world yeah. cup at the moment so uh you know, we know the Africans love their football and I think a tournament like that could be a sort of hero product for, for football and esports in Africa. It would be really, really exciting. So I wish you well, Ronnie, in that endeavour. Yeah, sure, yeah beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, so I think we can have one minute for everybody to uh, give in their closing remarks and then we will call it a day. So just a reminder for our audience that this session has been sponsored by Pragm Pragmatic Play and you can go online and check out some amazing games that they have to offer. So please, uh, one minute for everybody to uh, uh, give their closing remarks. We can start with Joe. We got to Mark. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, thanks, everyone. Yeah, because, really. yeah. Just because he's uh, appearing the first one on my screen. <laughs> uh, no, thanks, okay, Jeremiah, sure. for putting this together and for Max and Ronnie. I've really enjoyed being a part of it. And, you know, it's yeah. been really interesting for me as well. So thanks all. All I'm going to say is th this is this is an exciting industry. Yeah, it's an, in it's an industry. It can employ a lot of people. It can help with employment. It can help with taxes, stimulate the local economies. It's here to stay. And, and governments need to embrace it. You know, parents need to embrace it, as we've discussed. Educational institutions need to embrace it. I think Ronnie made a great point. It's not necessarily about regulation at this point, although it's, it's important for, for people's welfare and stuff, but it's about accessibility. It's about making everything within reach for people that want to try and play games and want to compete in esports in Africa. And that is absolutely key. And I will leave it there. Yeah, Joe, uh, thank you. And actually, uh, I totally agree with you. And uh, thank you for having me in this session. And thank you, Ronnie and Joe and Jeremy for great, great discussion. I believe we raised really important question in terms of unemployment and how to actually attract new talents to esports industry and to explore it in Africa. And I believe uh, right now we all understand uh, that... Um, having such businesses like sports book operators or finding a talented or invest into educational program for uh, younger generation is crucial for now and uh, also uh, we should all always remember that esports in the future uh, become actually as a real sports the, the with the highest popularity and this is a skill game so you need to train it you need to train skill you have to train each day and uh, but of course the balanced life not only online and playing but balanced life uh, should be included uh, at the part of uh, this esports life so thank you so much for uh, for such great conversation. I believe we don't we need more more time yeah to explore all the questions because we touched really really small part of it. We didn't talk about exactly. the sponsorship about data uh, yeah and uh, this is uh, this is also the main part uh, which we also can discuss and actually uh, special thanks 
uh, to Ronnie. Ronnie, uh, you're a top man, and thank you uh, for all that you're doing in your country, because this is really important. Thank you very yeah. much, uh, Max. Uh, thank you, Jeremiah, for, for having us here. It's really difficult to give the closing remarks when two wise men have already given theirs. <laughs> you fail to do what you add. But I'll just say uh, thank you, Jeremiah, and we need more of such sessions. And just to, to give a word out there to all other Africans putting in the work to grow the esports scene, to our friends, Gamer in Nigeria, Eniola, Kulmi, to solo esports in Senegal, you should check them out, Baba Dium to the likes of Goliath Gaming in South of Africa, to Morocco, who are doing well. By the way, they did very well in the FIFA E World Cup, making it up to the quarterfinals. And say the future of esports in, in Kenya is really bright. The future of esports in Africa is really bright. And just to put a word out there also to the publishers, try and bring in some of those events here, because right now we are focusing more on events. So just to put in the, the word there and to everyone doing something to support esports in Africa, big up to you, and we hope for the best. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I believe that uh, this has been a very, very insightful conversation. I'll also say thank you, Max. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you, Joe. And thank you to our audience for tuning in to uh, listening to this uh, conversation about esports. Uh, we usually have such uh, sessions on the first Friday of every new month. So I'm looking forward to having you uh, joining us in the next one. If not as speakers, you can join in as uh, viewers or listeners. And just a reminder that very soon this session is going to be available on Spotify as a podcast. So please uh, go on and follow us on Spotify at iGaming Africa. Africa is uh, Africa at the end with a K. And also you can watch this webinar on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. So I believe that you can uh, uh, jump on and uh, follow us at iGaming Africa. We are iGaming Africa across all platforms. Thank you also to our sponsor for this session. Uh, we really appreciate the help that you guys are giving us. So thank you, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much. Jeremy. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, thank you Jeremy. Cheers, so, guys. Ronnie, cheers. Cheers.